Good morning to those of you gathered here in the building for worship at Second Presbyterian Church in Portsmouth, Ohio. Good morning to those of you listening on the radio, and good afternoon to those of you who are watching online. If you walked in the building today and sat down and looked at your bulletin and thought, wow, I can see this better than I think I have previously, if you note the scaffolding here, we are in the process of changing the light bulbs. And I am told that we are not only um, at putting less stress on our wiring, but we will, because they are energy efficient, be putting less stress on our bank account as well. So as is often the habit when you get into building things, your original plan to complete everything doesn't always happen on time hence why the scaffolding is still there. So we are very grateful to Dave Smith, the wonderful electrician slash pastor who was here most of last week and will be coming back to finish the job on Monday. So we hope that you enjoy hopefully being able to see a little bit better with these upgraded light bulbs that'll be happening. Today we are grateful to have Justin Wiggett on the organ bench and Jonathan Burton as our soloist today and leading today's music. Thanks also to Wayne and Sandra Wheeler for sponsoring today's worship broadcast on WIOI. There are a few announcements in the bulletin I'd like to direct your attention to. There is a Sunday Vespers hymn sing this evening at 6 o'clock on WIOI. You are welcome to join us after worship today for Sunday school. Those are kind of the two ongoing things that we have right now. A little update on Stan's expanded and extended birthday fundraiser. He kind of changed the game on us last week, and instead of saying, of the two songs, whichever one raised the most money, he said, if you raise $2,000, I will sing and record both of those songs. So I'm pleased to report that we are less than $150 away from that $2,000 goal. So if you haven't given yet, but you've been meaning to, you could be the person that puts us over the top on our fundraising goal for that. Um, then the last thing I wanted to mention is that our Stewardship Dedication Sunday will be on November 1st, and so you should have received a letter in the card with a pledge, a letter in the mail with a pledge card, and you are invited to bring those with you to worship on Sunday, November 1st, or if you're not able to be here that day, you can mail those into the church office, and if we could have those by Friday, October 30th, that would be great. I don't think there are any other announcements this morning, but I want to say, as I always say, and just because I always say it doesn't mean I don't mean it, I am grateful that you are worshiping with us today, whether you are here in the building or listening from your home. And it is my prayer that God will come close to you in this time of worship and give you whatever it is that you need this day. For this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
please join with me in the call to worship printed in the bulletin. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Declare God's glory among the nations and God's marvelous works among the, the people. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. And let us pray. Holy God, you are the cornerstone of our fellowship and faith. And we are the living stones that make up your spiritual house. In this time of worship, inspire us to love in your name, to speak in your name, and to care in your name, that we may love the one whom no one loves, feed the hungry, visit the imprisoned, and give water to the thirsty in your name. Faced with your glory, we cannot help but become convicted of all the ways we fall short of your expectations. Trusting in the grace given to us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, in the quietness of this moment, hear our personal confession of sin. who is in a position to condemn us. Only you, holy God. And you died for us, and you rose for us, and even now you pray for us. Remind us of your forgiveness and saving grace that we might live in peace with ourselves and our neighbors. Come near to us in this time of worship and meet us right where we are. Open our eyes and ears and hearts to what you have to say to us today. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our first scripture reading today comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 45, verses 1 through 7. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me so that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make weal and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
Our second scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. Hear again what the Spirit is saying to you, the church. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice said why are you putting me to the test you hypocrites show me the coin used for the tax and they brought him a denarius then he said to them whose head is this and whose title they answered the emperor's then he said to them give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to god the things that are God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. They call it the match of the century. Against the background of the Cold War struggle, a gritty Russian chess master was challenged by the most uncooperative, uncommunicative, erratic chess player America had ever produced. A sports writer once said, every sport gets that one genius that comes once in a lifetime and shakes it to its very core and nothing remains the same ever again. That genius was Bobby Fischer. And in Reykjavik, Iceland, in the fall of 1972, he shocked the world by beating the reigning Russian world champion, Boris Spassky. Now, Bobby was known for his eccentricity as well as his arrogance. But he was equally well known for his consistent opening move the pawn in front of his queen to e4. And in the most pivotal moment of the whole match during game six, Bobby surprised Spassky by changing his opening move. And it instantly threw all of Spassky's careful preparations right out the window. Bobby Fischer, it is said, played the most un-Bobby-like game of chess, and it's been known as the most different and also the most beautiful game he ever played. And at the end, when he was beaten, Spassky stood up and applauded the American. You could say that today's gospel reading from Matthew is another sort of chess match another dramatic showdown where the strategists involved are top notch and the match is won by a surprise move. Now the Pharisees and the Herodians are a very unlikely tag team. They're a very unlikely tag team against Jesus in this chess match of words. The Pharisees strongly oppose the Roman Empire while the Herodians are actively working with the empire. Yet their mutual fear and desire to defeat Jesus is strong enough to unite them as a team. And their opening move is made with words of false flattery. Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with the truth and show deference to no one. And thinking or hoping that they have lulled Jesus into letting his guard down, they strike with their next move 
Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? And they think they have him now because they're asking a loaded question. If Jesus says yes, he alienates all the people who hate the Roman occupation and it's Caesar. If he says no, then he's liable for arrest from the Roman occupationers. Matthew's gospel is full of what are called controversy stories. Stories like this, where the religious leaders of the day are trying to trap Jesus into saying something incriminating. But this question about paying taxes, it's not just political, meant to try to get Jesus in trouble one way or another. It is a moral and a theological question as well. Because as we have seen in our own American history, what is legal is not necessarily what is moral. So what is lawful, from Roan's perspective, might not be acceptable to God. So the Pharisees and the Herodians think that they have Jesus stuck between a rock and a hard place. For him to say yes to either option would be to deny the other. Either answer may result in the beginning of the end for Jesus. So it is a clever gambit, to be sure, in this chess match of words between these two groups who are themselves in bed with Rome in order to further their own political and economic interests. It's clever, but it's not clever enough. In his own surprise move, Jesus' response about giving to Caesar what is Caesar's and giving to God what is God's cleverly sidesteps the trap and swiftly knocks this unlikely tag team of the Pharisees and the Herodians back on their heels and indeed out of the match. Just as one pays taxes due to Caesar, Jesus says, one should also pay what is due to God. But it's not as simple as that for those spectators who are watching this chess match between Jesus and the religious leaders. Because for people like them, paying taxes means supporting an oppressive and violent regime. But on the other hand, refusing to pay taxes is to become an enemy of the empire, which will surely bring its own set of dire consequences. Thinking about this quandary, one writer suggests that paying to God and participating in the divine kingdom entails repenting of the ways that they have been complicit in the Roman Empire and its agenda. Paradoxically, then, he goes on to say, people should pay the taxes the empire has imposed upon them while actively resisting and working to promote an alternative kingdom instead. The coin they produce when Jesus asks for it bears the name and the title, the image of Caesar. But the coinage of God's kingdom, this alternative kingdom, is of a radically different nature than that of Caesar. God does not trade in Caesar's currency. Instead, God throws open the gates as an inauguration of God's heavenly kingdom, inviting everyone to participate and to embrace its ways of justice and righteousness, things that are fundamentally at odds with Caesar's kingdom in the Roman Empire. For Jesus, this verbal chess match is about so much more than just paying taxes. One writer I read this week suggests that governments are necessary, taxes may be necessary, and every country has a Caesar of some sort to contend with. So render unto that Caesar whatever is due. 
but don't mess around with the things that belong to God. And so with this handful of strategic words, Jesus changes the game and elevates it far beyond just a verbal chess match, and it becomes a battle for the soul. That's a provocative thought, isn't it? Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but don't mess around with the things that belong to God. The first question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism, written all the way back in 1563, reminds us that we are not our own, but we belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't mess around with the things that belong to God. That includes us. But it doesn't always feel like that, does it? Some days it feels like we belong to Caesar with taxes and legal restrictions on our freedoms and imprisonment if we engage in civil disobedience. Other days, it feels like our job owns us, or our families, or our responsibilities, or our habits and addictions, or even our material possessions that we work so hard to purchase. But who do we really belong to? In the same way that Jesus and those religious leaders examined that denarius coin, look at someone else. Look at yourself in the mirror when you get home from church today. Look at that person. Whose inscription is written on that heart? In whose image is that person made? In whose image are you made? Every person you will look upon in all the days of your life is made in the image of God. Every person, even us on our very crankiest and worst days, every person is made in the image of God. So there can be no doubt what Jesus means here. Give yourselves to God because you belong to God. Though it may feel like it some days, we do not belong to anything or anyone else, not even ourselves. We belong to God with all our being, with all our talents, our interests, our time, our resources. And belonging to God means that God will never forsake us. And we can count on that. And because we belong to God, we belong to the people of God, to the body of Christ gathered here today and listening who knows where on the radio and over the internet. And so we who hear this message, we give ourselves to God in times of worship like this and in lives of daily work and service to God. All of that is worship. All of it. And ultimately, giving ourselves to the one who gave his only son not to condemn the world, but in order that the world may be saved through him. Well, that means we give ourselves to the world, to our hurting, broken, beautiful world. And that means we must also give ourselves to the hard work of transforming that world into this alternative kind of kingdom that Jesus is always talking about, making it on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Please join with me in our affirmation of faith as it is printed in the bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us join our hearts and minds together in a word of prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for all your gifts to us, for daily food, for health, for each breath we take, for freedom to choose, and for the gifts of your word, your power, and your love. Our hearts are truly overwhelmed, O oh God, when we consider how you have entrusted so much to us. May we be worthy of that trust. May we be a people who are unafraid to live as fully and as richly as you want us to live. When we aren't sure, help us to be calm. When information comes at us from all sides, both correct and not, help us to discern wisely. When fear makes it hard to breathe and anxiety seems to be the order of the day, slow us down, God. Help us to reach out with our hearts when we can't touch with our hands. Help us to be socially connected even when we have to be physically distant. Help us to love as perfectly as we can, knowing that your perfect love casts out all our fear. For the doctors, we pray. For the nurses, we pray. For the healthcare related technicians and janitors and aid and caregivers, we pray. For the scientists and researchers, we pray. For all who are still working, we pray. For those who would work but do not have a job, we pray. For parents at their wits end, we pray. For teachers at their wits end, we pray for anyone at their wits end during this time of profound disruption, we pray. For demonstrators, we pray. For looters and rioters, we pray. For police officers, we pray. For community leaders, 
we pray. For candidates running for election, especially for president and vice president, we pray. For firefighters and EMS responders, we pray. For the least and the lost, we pray. For those who despair, we pray. For those whom no one loves, we pray. And hear us now from the quietest corners of our hearts as we whisper to you the joys and concerns we bring with us to worship today. Remind us that we are not a people of fear. We are a people of courage. We are not a people of greed. We are a people of generosity. We are indeed your people, made in your image, giving and loving wherever you are, whatever it costs, for as long as it takes, wherever you call us. And hear us now as we pray together the way the church has prayed for generation after generation. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our benediction today once again comes from the wise and wonderful worlds of the black poet Maya Angelou. May you continue to be who and how you are to astonish a mean world with your acts of kindness. May you continue to allow humor to lighten the burden of your tender heart. May you continue to laugh in the midst of a dark world that others may hear the grandeur of God in your laughter. May you put the mantle of your protection around the bodies of the young and defenseless and those in need of justice. And may faith be the bridge you build to overcome evil and welcome good. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.